Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be doing a review of The Survivor by James Herbert. So as always, I'm going to read you the blurb, then I'm going to go through and check out some of my tabs. I don't have too many. And then I'll share my overall thoughts and rating at the end. Dane reads. What I will say is if you've ever read the, the novel Survivor by um, fucking Chuck Palahniuk, it's kind of similar. They both involve planes. That's actually about as far as the similarities go, but still a weird coincidence, I guess. I don't know whether Paul and Nick had ever read this. I, I wouldn't be surprised if he had, to be honest. Anyway, blurb. It had been one of the worst crashes in airline history, killing over 300 people and leaving only one survivor. Now the dead were buried and the town of Eton tried to forget, but one man could not rest. Keller had walked from the flames of the wreck, driven on by unseen forces, seeking the answer to his own survival, until the town was forced to face the shocking, dreadful truth about what was buried in the cold graveyard, and a truth Keller did not want to believe. So what I will say is off the back of reading The Rats and then The Fog, this is very different, um, this is more of like a thriller than an outright horror novel I guess. But also what I particularly liked about those other two books was the way they were written, it felt very conversational like just having a chat with somebody in a pub, whereas this feels much more like a traditional novel, you know? So I'm going to read you a little bit about Keller here right at the start, and this mentions that he has a bit of amnesia around it, which is one of my most hated book tropes. It's just annoying when characters can't remember, especially when it's been told by an omniscient narrator. It's like, well, the character can't remember, but you bloody know, mate, so just tell us. Fucking hey. Keller ordered a beer and found himself a table in a quiet corner. The barman had barely given him a second glance, and for this he was grateful. The past four weeks had been a nightmare of questions, innuendos, staring faces and abrupt silences. His colleagues and bosses at Consul, the airline company he flew for, had been mostly kind and considerate apart from the few who had viewed him with a strange suspicion. And then the newspapers had played up the story. The crash, dramatic and catastrophic though it had been, wasn't enough for them. That a man could walk from the terrible carnage unscathed, even his uniform on marked, was proclaimed a miracle. Intensive medical examination found no internal injuries. There were no burns, his nerves appeared to be stable. Physically he seemed to be perfect except for one thing, amnesia. Indeed he experienced total amnesia as far as the crash and the events leading up to it were concerned. It was the shock of course, the doctors told him, and in time when his mind had healed enough to remember, to allow him to remember, then it would all come back. But there was always the possibility his mind would never heal. And now uh, here Keller is going to wake up from some, some dreams. I'm going to read it out, but uh, I, I found this quite interesting because dreams have always like fascinated me because I used to dream a lot when I was a kid. And then for, for, for probably from when I was about 17 to when I was 31, never really dreamt. I had occasional dreams. Um, but it's to do with smoking because once I quit smoking, the dreams came back with a vengeance. So like, oh man, sleep is kind of horrible at the moment because I never know whether I'm, I know I'm going to dream. I just don't know what it's going to be about. Sometimes they're nice, sometimes they're not. You know, sometimes they're sexy dreams. Sometimes they're everybody's trying to kill you dreams. And I also generally have like anxiety just before I fall asleep. So I go to bed and I'm feeling fine. And then as I start to fall asleep, I get really bad anxiety and it kind of wakes me back up and I sort of end up falling into like passing out basically. But anyway, Keller woke with a start. One moment he was asleep, the next wide awake with no intermediary stages of regaining consciousness. For an instant, his eyes stared up at the ceiling then moved swiftly towards his watch lying on the bedside cabinet. Seven o'clock exactly. What had wakened him so sharply? Had he dreamed? He'd been a heavy dreamer up until the crash. The dreams always vivid, memorable, almost tiring. But since there had been nothing, although he knew this was impossible. Everybody dreamed to some extent, whether they realised or not. For the past few weeks though, he had just seemed to fall asleep instantly, then to wake just as quickly, with only emptiness in between, as though he had merely blinked his eyes for a half second. Perhaps it was his mind's way of protecting him, keeping the nightmare deep within the folds of his subconscious, erasing any trace before he woke. So this bit here is written much more like how um, Herbert's written in his, in his first two books. Uh, and it's this kind of writing I like, he kind of jumps from character to character and he really quickly sets up who the character is and what they're doing and their motivations for it and it's usually something awful, you know? So I'm just going to read the first two paragraphs here of chapter 8. Emily Platt was slowly poisoning her husband to death. She was taking her time deliberately, not just to allay suspicion when his death finally came, but because she wanted him to suffer for as long as possible. Over the past three weeks she had kept the doses of Gramoxone small so that his health would break down gradually and undramatically, but she had been surprised at how soon he had become bedridden. The paraquat contained in the weed killer was much more potent than she had imagined, and the first dose Emily had administered to his morning coffee had frightened her with its suddenness of attack. Allowing him a couple of days to recover his strength, she had cut down on the doses drastically so that his suffering had become less acute and more protracted. Naturally their doctor had had to be called in at the first most violent attack, but he was totally mystified by the illness. He was an unimaginative man. 
He told Emily if her husband got any worse within the next few days, he would have to be admitted into hospital for proper care and tests to discover the nature of the illness. However, as she had eased up on the doses of the poison and her husband's condition had appeared to improve, the doctor had seen no cause for alarm. He had merely left instructions to be called in promptly if the illness did not disappear completely within the next few days. Of course, Emily had not bothered to get in touch with him again, and her unfortunate husband had been too weak to do so himself. And uh, she works in an antique shop, and this bit I thought was quite interesting. Occasionally, she glanced up from her task to see if the young man was still there, and for some reason other than business, hoped he would come into the shop. Too often people stared through the window, their eyes lovingly examining the objects displayed, and too often they wandered on to the next shop along without bothering to come in. Even if they did, there was never any guarantee they would buy. Antique shops were similar to bookshops, there for browsing but not necessarily for buying. It had infuriated her when she was younger that people could spend so much time examining, even worshipping these treasures, asking questions, funneling them, and then walk out of the shop as though they had been merely passing the time of day. But her father had taught her never to harass or even try to influence a potential customer, and never, under any circumstances, to bargain over an object. Their profession was too dignified for that sort of thing. They could leave that to the street traders. And um, she starts to discover some sexual aberrations in her husband. So we get... Um, and then he had wanted to use orifices other than the obvious for his climaxes. This had horrified and revolted her more than she could say, but strangely, his weakness had made him strong, if stubbornness could be called strength. She began to feel frightened of him. Her father's rages had been quiet, but no less forbidding. Cyril's were wild, emotional, and terrifying. Although he had never actually beaten her, the threat of violence was always there, his tantrums carrying him to the very edge of physical aggression. Emily had no alternative but to succumb. Raised in a devoutly religious atmosphere, she now found it impossible to visit the church. How could she now she was a party to such perversion? And then, after three years of such torture, Cyril's aberration took on an even worse aspect. He demanded that she beat him. Reluctantly, she had conformed, but he had screamed that she was not trying, she was not hurting him. In fear, she had renewed her efforts, and this time he had cried out in pain. And oddly, his cry brought her pleasure. She had used the flat of her hand at first, but this was not enough for her. Her eyes cast around for something that would give more pain, and they fixed upon a leather belt he had left, purposefully, by the side of the bed. She grabbed it and flayed him, rejoicing in his screams, venting the oppression of a lifetime on the thin, naked body that cowered away from her. The pity was that for all the agony, or perhaps because of it, he had enjoyed it too, and when her anger had been spent, he begged for more. Disgust for herself, disgust for him, disgust for their life together, had swept through her, a sinking grey misery enveloping and smothering her spirit. But now she was caught up in the inextricable downward spiral of degradation. She lived the next two years in a state of abject wretchedness as his perversion inevitably grew worse. He developed a liking for being bound and locked up, and then, perhaps worst of all, a penchant for wearing her clothes. Emily discovered this last trait of his when she went upstairs one day to the flat above the antique shop to make some tea for her afternoon break. She found Cyril in their bedroom, admiring himself in the full-length wardrobe mirror. He was wearing her underwear, even her tights, and an obscene bulge pushed out against the thin material of her panties. He laughed at her shot. Had he wanted her to discover him like this? and she saw lipstick covered his ugly mocking lips. It, will, it would all have been very funny had it not been so pathetic and real. Emily's one small consolation throughout was that it had all been kept within the bounds of their marriage, but now even that was changing. He had begun to go out on his own in the evenings, something he'd rarely done in the past. She soon found out through the suspicious and secretly delighted reports of some of the few friends she still had. He was keeping the company of some very dubious young men in Windsor. As a slight relief, his demands on her became less frequent, although his desire for anal sex increased. It was perfectly obvious, even to one of her sheltered upbringing, that he had finally formed homosexual relationships with other men. She now understood that this is what their own sexual relationship had been about. He had tried to hide the stigma of his weakness from himself, but had tried to achieve the results of it through their marriage. It was inevitable that the path he had chosen would eventually lead to the one he had tried to avoid. And most perverse of all, the fact she tried to keep from herself but finally had to admit, was that she now felt cheated, cuckolded. And we get a reference to um, people working late in a dark room to get some photos ready, which I thought kind of dates the book more than anything else in it, I think. But uh, interesting nonetheless. Here's a little bit from chapter 18, which I think is probably even more relevant today than when it was written. It looked as if the vehicle was near the church again. Oh dear, don't say the vicar's had another relapse. He took it to himself. Reverend Biddlestone had only returned from hospital that afternoon, so he'd been told. Bloody doctors nowadays, sending patients home before they're properly fit just because their hospitals are crowded. You've got to be dying to get a hospital bed these days, and then you'd better die fast or they have you out again. He shook his head in disgust and threw back into the room, closing the window with a thump. And he's looking at the photos, and they're quite disturbing. Uh, here's this final bit I want to read out of what he sees on one of the photos. As I say, it's just creepy, man. 
Old fighter is creepy. He had expected to see a shot of one of the Jumbo's jet engines lying alone in the field, separated from the wing it had been housed under, a mangled sculpture of sophisticated metal rendered useless by the impact. A group of men, all carrying clipboards, were standing around it, examining its exposed machinery, one of them gingerly lifting the displaced thrust cone lying several feet away. That's what he had expected to see. Instead, the image that came through, slowly at first, then with a rush, was that of a man. The strangest, most evil looking man Ernest had ever set eyes on. He was totally naked, his thin, emaciated body twisted with disease as though the worms that welcomed corpses lay to rest beneath the ground were already devouring his living body. His gaunt face was a mask of grinning evil, the eyes burning malevolently from the darkened paper, the mouth revealing broken teeth amid glistening lips in its wicked leer. Sparse clumps of hair hung from his bare scalp, and deep lines, the black wrinkles of perversity, filled his face as though it were a rocky landscape from some far-off rain-starved land. The sparrow-like shoulders were hunched forward, the rounded abdomen and thin pelvis thrust forward in an obscene gesture. In his bony, claw-like hands, he held his oversized swollen penis, the testicles hanging like two grotesquely stretched sacks almost to his knees. The reed-like legs that supported his skeletal frame were riddled with pockmarks, evidence of some still lingering pestilence. But yeah, The Survivor by James Herbert, it was okay, it was nowhere near as good as either The Rats or The Fog, but I'm, you know, hoping that some of the other James Herberts I've got will kind of drag the average back up again. Overall, I gave it a pretty weak 3.5 out of 5. It was alright, but definitely not one to start with if you're new to James Herbert. This is more for the completionists, I feel. So there we have it, that's what I made of The Survivor by James Herbert. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments what you thought of this book. If you read it, hit that like button. If you've enjoyed this video, hit that subscribe button for more and I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye bye.